Good evening. Um, welcome to tonight's James Chase Lecture Series event. Um, as most of you know, our program is focused throughout the semester on bringing together some of the leading big picture thinkers in the area of international affairs. And however, we have a tradition of saving an event, um, a wild card event, at the end of each season for the consideration of one specific issue of foreign policy that's the central focus of the country and the world at any particular time. In the fall, our final event focused on the emerging financial crisis when we hosted Robert Samuelson of Newsweek. And this year, we've decided to focus on the situation in Pakistan. In a press conference yesterday marking the 100th, his 100th day in office, President Obama highlighted the situation there and, and referred to it as very fragile. For reasons you'll hear in a few minutes, this has been a recurrent theme in his administration. Since coming to office, his senior, uh, senior advisors have consistently focused their attention on the region and have, have highlighted it as one of, the, one of the highest priorities for the, the new administration. So tonight we have the pleasure to welcome two experts on the region who actually cover both bases. Not only do they, they each hold important insights regarding the situation on the ground, but also have broad exposure across a host of strategic issues in the international affairs arena. With respect to the situation in Pakistan, both Parag Khanna and Jonathan Paris have each written extensively on the situation there and have each done work for the US government related to the region over the last several months. Parag is a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation where he's director of the America Strategy Program. He, uh, he also spoke to us last semester, as many of you may recall, uh, about his new book, The Second World, How Emerging Powers Are Redefining Global Competition in the 21st Century. Jonathan Harris is an associate fellow at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization at King's College London. He has long been engaged in a diverse range of projects across the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. We'll start this evening with an introduction by Parag in which he'll discuss the recent history and the current situation in the country. Next, Jonathan will outline a range of future scenarios for Pakistan. This event tonight is co-sponsored by Foreign Affairs Magazine, for whose support we're very grateful. With that, I'd like to turn the floor to Parag Khan for his opening comments. Thank you all very much. Um, there's some familiar faces maybe from previous uh, classes. And um, I think it's probably best to view tonight as a, as a continuous conversation. There's going to be significant complementarity between what I say and what uh, Jonathan says. And I think one of the key um, ways to approach this evening is to not, you are bombarded with facts uh, all the time, every day, in the newspaper, on television, uh, rhetoric, polemics. Uh, scares, uh, you know, information analysis about what's happening in Afghanistan and Pakistan. What we hope to, I think, give you tonight is uh, what is appropriate for a classroom setting, which is explanation uh, of what is happening, not just more facts. And with that, uh, what I want to do is to begin with a step back and try to explain why you're seeing what you're seeing in the headlines today about uh, Pakistan. And I'm going to give you one somewhat complicated term, uh, and then I'm going to explain to you what it means. Term is post-colonial entropy. That's the one you can write down if you're taking notes and if Carter's going to test you on it later on. Uh, the way in which I believe we should understand what's happening uh, in Pakistan today is through this lens of post-colonial entropy. Let me explain what I mean by that. Pakistan was created, uh, as you all know, through the partition of the Indian subcontinent in 1947. Uh, unlike many countries that you're familiar with, maybe in Africa, where they have um, you know, a border that is drawn along a longitudinal line and therefore you know, divides uh, the same tribe in half and, and so forth, and, and the borders are considered uh, illegitimate or, or similar to that, um, in Pakistan, both of its major borders are in a way considered by many people to be uh, erroneous or not in line with the ethnic and geographic uh, features that would that might have been more appropriate. And part of what is happening today, not only in um, uh, in uh, on India's 
eastern border in the, um, in the unresolved part of partition in Kashmir, but for our purposes today, more importantly, on the, on the western border, is grappling with um, the, the formation or the, the, the codification of Pakistan's uh, border on the western side as well, the so-called uh, Duran line. So post-colonial entropy, the reason that applies here is that we are seeing the, the decay of, uh, of, of that, that border's ability to hold uh, over time uh, with, the, with the end of, uh, of uh, the colonial era and the independence of uh, both India and Pakistan. Another is one, uh, is one that you're, you'll all be familiar with from, the new, from um, anything that you have read about Pakistan over the years. The one axiom of modern Pakistani political studies is the following sentence. The military is the only institution capable of holding the country together. Raise your hand if you have not heard that sentence before. Exactly. You've all heard it before, and we all take it to be true, and we've all mimicked it or aped it uh, over the years. That is false. That is false, and it should never be repeated again. The military may have once been the only institution capable, capable of holding the society or the state together. Post-colonial entropy tells you that that could not last forever. In the current context, you have uh, you know people think of the Pakistani military as a highly professional, large, based on a British model, so on, so on. But the decay of that professionalism has been going on for any number of decades. One has seen its failure in the partition of uh, Pakistan into East and West with the creation of Bangladesh in 1971. We've seen it through uh, their. Uh, some of, the, some of their losses and conflicts with, uh, with India over the years, most certainly in Cargill. And the number one um, uh, trend which eroded the, that vaunted professionalism of the Pakistani military was, of course, the Islamization of the country and the military ranks that happened under General Zeeul uh, in the, in the, in the um, uh, over the past uh, the 70s and 80s in particular through the, uh, the anti-Soviet war. Now, post-colonial entropy also helps us to understand the failure of the political system. Uh, what was considered, what was a, uh, you know, a, a British uh, trained administrative apparatus has devolved into what? Feudal politics again, right? The Bhutos, the Sharifs, the, uh, the way in which political parties really are just capsules for uh, dynastic uh, familial interests the lack of land reform in the country uh, since independence, and so forth. So this decay, again, of the political center, loyalty to that political center, is another example of post-colonial entropy. By the way, in this particular domain, not the military or, or, um, uh, or the borders to some extent, but, but in terms of the uh, administrative capacity and, uh, and central federal authority of the state, Believe it or not, you also see this happening in India. Right now, India is in the midst of an election that takes you know, over a month, really, to conduct. And what are we seeing? We're seeing the rise of local, caste-based, ethnic, regional parties, and the weakening of the central parties, Congress and the BJP. Now, Congress may eke this election out. That, again, is not a sign of a strong center. It means that they're just really barely holding on, and slowly, perceptibly, over time, India is also you know, uh, um, coming, you know, uh, I should say, you know, power is dissipating within the country. And again, one could say that the return or the, 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 the continuous strengthening of feudal politics in Pakistan is another example of that. The infrastructure really parallels administrative capacity as well. In post-colonial societies, you, are, you inherit what, you, what, what has been given to you by the colonial power. Uh, in the case of India and, and the subcontinent, it's, of course, the railways and the English language and the administrative system. 